Well, good morning. I don't think this is on, Christian. There we go. Appreciate Christian pinch hitting for Rick today, who is, uh, had a chance to be away on a little trip, vacation, so appreciate his willingness to step in. Well, if you'd take your Bibles and turn to the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, we're going to be looking at the final countdown here this morning. And uh, so I have, I have a question I want us to ask, I want to ask you to begin with here, and that is, how many of you have seen the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Okay. Do you remember that scene where Tevye, the, the poor milkman, the father of five daughters rather than five sons who's struggling in life, and he's living in a traditional world, and it's all coming apart, and he's coming home, his horse is lame, and Tevye is talking with God in that kind of personal one-on-one uh, dialogue that he has with God, and he says, the good book says, heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. In other words, send us the cure, we've got the sickness already. Do you ever feel that way, tired and weary, and you're just, you know, you're living for the Lord, you're trying to to do all the right things, and you're trying to hang in there, but life is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle, and sometimes it seems to just get too much. And and when it seems like all the opposition is winning, do you ever question, where, God, where where are you, and, and Where is your cure? I think that's the context of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel was extremely weary of all the things that were going on around him, and he found the the courage to go on. So let's take a look here, starting at uh, verse 1 of Daniel 9. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, which is another word for Babylonians. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the numbers or the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God. To, to seek him by prayer, supplication, with fasting, and sackcloth and ashes. Now, we met Darius back in chapter 6 when Cyrus, the Persian, conquered Babylon, and he left Darius, the Mede, in charge. Same Darius, and uh, it, it's, in cha- it's here in chapter 9. We don't have any... Okay. I'm going to need something, so if you want to turn up the the pulpit mic, Christian, that'll work, and we'll just use that. How's that sound? There we go. Something, isn't it? Okay. Okay, well, it's the same Darius. It's the, uh, it was in chapter 9, and in in the first year of Darius' reign um, was about 539 B.C., now, Nebuchadnezzar had invaded Jerusalem, and he hauled Daniel off into exile into Babylon in 605 B.C. And, and Daniel now, at this point in time, is in his early 80s. So he's been living in a pagan society, the, the Babylonian society, for about 68 years. And Daniel is reading the prophet Jeremiah. <clears throat> and that was his routine, pray three times a day, read scripture, That's why he got tossed into the lion's den, okay? So in the 23 years before Daniel's hauled off to Babylon, God has been speaking through Jeremiah, and he'd been warning his people, you're not listening to me. You're not obeying me. Turn back to me, or I'm going to send judgment. Well, finally, in Jeremiah 25, God specifically says, I've had it. And I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar to haul you off to exile. I mean, that's what Daniel is referring to in in Jeremiah 25, 11. This whole land, meaning Palestine, this whole land is 
will be in desolation and horror, and these nations are going to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And so Daniel and his people have been in exile now for some 68 plus years, and so Daniel is taking God at his word, and it's like, time's up. It's, it's time to go home. Now, what I want us to do here is we look at the prayer here in verses 4 through 19. I want to read the entire prayer, make some observations, then coming back to it, okay? So we'll look at verse 4, and we read Daniel's prayer. He says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, we've sinned and committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled over or even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we've not listened to your servant, the prophets, who spoke in your name to kings and princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. So he's reminding them of the warnings of Jeremiah. Verse 7, righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame, it is, as is to this day to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all of Israel and those who are nearby and those who are far away and all the countries to which you have driven them. Because they have of their unfaithful deeds, which they've committed against you, open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we've sinned against you. To the Lord our God, belong compassion and forgiveness <clears throat> for he has rebelled against him nor have we reserve, observed the voice of our Lord our God to, to walk in his teachings which he set before us through his servant the prophets indeed all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside not obeying your voice so the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Verse 12, thus he has confirmed his word which he's spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring us great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we've not even sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. So they've never repented. Verse 14, Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us, for the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as it is this day. We have sinned. We've been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of of our sin and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach on all those who are around us. <coughs> Excuse me. Now would be a good time for some mercy and grace. <laughs> Verse 17. So now, our God, listen to the prayers of your servant and to his supplication. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merit of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action for your own sake. O my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. Let's stop there and make a couple of observations here. There are two observations that I want us to make. And the first is I want us to notice that the focus of Daniel's prayer is on God. In verse 4, Daniel begins with adoration. He says, you know, 
God is the great and awesome God. The God who made the mountains, the God who spread the seas, and, and he made the sun to rule the day and the moon to light the night. <clears throat> he is the God who, who keeps his covenant uh, and his loving kindness for those who love him. God provides for us. God cares for us. God nurtures us. God is patient with us and gracious towards us. Verse 7, righteousness belongs to you, O Lord. He's saying he, God, is holy. He is without sin. He's separated from his creation. And in verse 9, to the Lord our God belongs compassion and forgiveness. He is the God who chooses to save us for his own sake, not ours. Verse 14, what God does here is in accord with his righteousness. So salvation and judgment, he, he's always acting without sin. He's always acting in a just manner, and he is always holy. Adoration is all about God. Who God is, his character, exalting him. The king is exalted on high. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to take some time this week, maybe as you do your own daily prayer time or, or Bible reading time, but to take some time and, and carve it out and say, I'm going to do this this week, and I am going to meditate on, on, on and follow Daniel's example here and think about God who he is, and, and speak words of praise, speak words of exaltation to him. He's the only one who is worthy of adoration. Daniel's request is, is, is according to God's will. So this is a prayer that's all about God. Verse 16, he says, O Lord, in accordance with your righteous act, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. In, in verse 17, for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. I mean, then in verse 18, answer your prayer, not because of our merits, but on account of your great compassion. And, and then verse 19, for your sake, don't delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. This is about God's will praying in conformity to the will of God. Daniel knows the prophecy. He also knows that God keeps his word. He's experienced that. He knows the character of God. Daniel's prayer here is asking for God to act in accordance with his, uh, his character and to accomplish his will. As Jesus prayed in Matthew, uh, or in, in, taught in Matthew 6, there in verses 9 and 10, where he said, Hallowed be your name in the model prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, way too often when we come to prayer and our prayers are, are all about us, we skip through the adoration part. We give a token acknowledgement. We'll say, oh, almighty God, we ask this, and we call him almighty. And then we rush right to our shopping list of requests and concerns and cares. I mean, what does God want us to pray about? Have we ever asked that question of ourselves? What's he want us to pray about? What is on his heart? That's what we need to focus on many times. We need to spend some time, maybe make it a prayer time where we don't even ask God for anything other than what he, we want to ask him to teach. He wants to teach us. What do you want to teach me, Lord? A second observation here is, I want you to see Daniel's honesty before God. He had, he had deserved this. He's, he's saying, we deserve this. God, God wrote down his expectations. He's declared to us, you know, since the day of Moses, we didn't obey. God sent prophet, prophet after prophet after prophet to warn us, to call us to repentance. We didn't listen. And, and then he told us that judgment was going to come. We still rejected him. God did exactly what he said that he would do, and we're the ones that deserve to be in exile. Isn't that different from most of what we hear today? Notice the we. 
Over and over, Daniel lists the prayers or the sins of his people. And Daniel could have easily been detached. He could have easily detached himself and, and been judgmental and said, they did this and now I'm living in exile. But he included himself. He said, we deserve this. Is there anyone who's never sinned? See, we all deserve God's punishment for sin, don't we? The wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's easy sometimes for us as Christians to see ourselves as solutions and not as a part of the problem. I mean, others deserve what they get. We're, we're just, you know, we're, we're just getting collateral damage from the fall. If, if they hadn't have fallen, then we wouldn't have this problem here today. And we struggle with the same temptations, though, as, as those that are around us. <clears throat> maybe in a different way. Maybe to some varying degrees, but we're all human, aren't we? And the difference with, with those who are without Jesus, they don't have any answers. But those of us with Jesus who know Jesus, we know where to turn for the answers, don't we? But we all still struggle. And Daniel's kind of honesty before God sees our participation in the sins of our society, which is where we live, because we are all sinners. We're living before a holy and a just and an awesome God, and all of us are deserving the punishment. Look at verse 20 now and following there. He says, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision previous. Remember, Gabriel was a messenger sent by God to Daniel to explain the visions to him, make sure he understood it. <clears throat> then Gabriel came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding from the vision. Now, see, while Daniel is praying, and, and Daniel is extremely weary. I mean, this has been an uphill battle for him for 60-plus years. And, and, and he's been living in this pagan society. And, and he's going, God, where's your cure? And, and, and we can kind of relate a little bit how Daniel feels. And, and, and God answers Daniel that while he is still speaking and praying and confessing and, and pleading, and Daniel's going on on in prayer, and the command has already been given. The, the plan's already in place. The events are already in motion. God has already taken action. The cure is already at work. But I want us to notice something here. God regards Daniel. Gabriel is sent to Daniel to tell Daniel that he is highly esteemed. Now, how would how would you handle that? I mean, you're being pounded by the world. And uh, how would it help you when you're in that kind of a situation to hear, you know, the great and awesome God tell you that he sees what you're going through, that he hears your prayer, that he is already working, and that he highly esteems you? I mean, wouldn't that be a huge stamp of approval on Daniel's you know, his character and his attitude in prayer. Daniel, you're on the right track. Keep going. I'm with you. I got your back. Wouldn't you feel like you had somebody has your back? I think so. But look at verses 24 through 27 here. We see God's answer to Daniel's prayer. <clears throat> Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sin, and to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in the last everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place, so that you are to know and discern from 
the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, where there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing in the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Dissolutions and uh, desolations and, and are determined, and he will make firm co- a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he'll be put a, put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the, the wing of ab- admonitions uh, will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, there's a lot there, and there's a lot we don't understand, and that's an understatement. But I want you to understand this. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. And sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait. And sometimes God just blows our minds. But I first want us to see here the meaning of the weeks. Daniel had been reading Jeremiah's prophecy up back up in the second verse. He'd been reading that and the 70 years of exile that God's people are, are at the core of this prophecy. And the reason for the 70 years of judgment was Israel's failure to obey God. I mean, Daniel says that in verse 11 and 13. All the calamity, this exile, this judgment, God poured out on us because we did not obey what God instructed us through Moses. Moses had instructed the Jews to plant crops for six years. In the sixth year, God would give them a bumper crop, and then they were to save that, and then they would then let the land lay for a year. He was, the bumper crop was big enough to take care of the sixth year, the seventh year, and actually into the very next year before that harvest came in. Okay? So we have six years to grow, one year to rest. But instead, they'd gotten greedy, and they disobeyed God. They didn't trust God for the provision of that seventh year. And so they kept the bumper crop, and then they went ahead and planted the seventh year, and they did that for 70 cycles of seven for a total of 490 years. They never made it to seven years to trust. Now, God sends his people into exile for 70 years, one year for every seven-year cycle that they disobeyed uh, in verse 24, and he labels those years as 70 weeks. Same here, I think. Weeks are like years. 490 years breaks down into seven times seven periods of seven. Put more easily, one week equals seven years. Second, though, there is a definite starting point to this, and that's in verse 25. The decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Back in Nehemiah, according to Nehemiah chapter 2, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was issued in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes, which doesn't mean a whole lot, except that, that, that we know that there is a date that was there, that God has preserved that for us. Historians, contemporaries of Artaxerxes, ha- have kept historical records of Artaxerxes, which includes dates. So we know from sources it, in the Bible as outside the Bible that agree that the decree to uh, restore Jerusalem was issued, and that was in the year 445 B.C. Third, God gives us a way to check our answers. To know if we really understand what God is saying here, God wants us, I think God wants us to get it right. He doesn't want us to be confused about all this stuff. So what, when people get confused, what do they normally do? Avoid. They don't want to have anything to do with it. In verse 25, though, he, uh, God divides the 70 weeks into three groups of weeks. So there's seven weeks, and then there's 62 weeks, and then a 70th week that we'll come into in verse 27. And Gabriel says, 
that from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem in 445 B.C. to the coming Messiah, that is Jesus, that would be seven weeks and 62 weeks or 483 years. Then the Messiah will be cut off. Now, if you take the time to do the math and consider the Jewish year is 360 days instead of 365, correcting the fact that there was the four-year error in the dating of the birth of Jesus at 1 AD rather than 4 BC, and you do all the calculations, as some have done, you got 483 years, which comes into the spring of 32 AD. Or the very is what some scholars believe the time that Jesus entered the city Jerusalem on Palm Sunday riding a donkey. Or the very week that Jesus, the Messiah, was crucified, cut off. And because we can see the fulfillment of Daniel, as was being told, we know that our understanding of the weeks is pretty accurate. A fourth observation is the 70th week hasn't happened. Things like making an end of sin, uh, making atonement for our iniquity, bringing an everlasting righteousness, we're still waiting on that. And prophecy is often like looking over the mountaintop and seeing the tops of a mountain at a mountain range, but we don't see the valleys in between the mountains. And Daniel's standing in a valley, and he's looking up at a mountain a slope of history to this summit. And beyond that, he's given a glimpse of a mountain peak that's further on. And what we don't see is, is the valley that's in between the mountains. And what they have, have described as this valley in between the mountains now is the church age in which we live. <laughs> And it's almost like it's almost like the prophetic clock has stopped for a while. And when this period of waiting is over, or this valley gets that time is is taken care of, uh, the clock is you know it's going to start ticking again, just like it did up to the crucifixion. It it ticks then, and it's going to tick again. God said it in the past. And it'll happen in the future. What he says is true. Which leads us to the fifth observation. And the point of the answer here is found in this last week. The prince who is to come, same person we identified last, uh, is, is coming, this abominable, this uh, antichrist king who's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary of God, and he's going to make a covenant with many that's going to last for a week, and then after he's halfway through it, he's going to break it and put it an end to sacrifice and grain offerings and warring against God's people. In verse 27, all that wearies us goes on until complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. And the timing helps us to understand that this last week is, is seven years, and it's a real period of time with a beginning and an end, but God has set the boundaries. God has set the boundaries of what will happen, and this admonition guy is going to get it. That's what we need to hang on to. One thought of application here. The point of the prophecy isn't the prophecy. The prophecy is the answer to Daniel's prayer. God answers Daniel's questions about God's timing and, and restoration of his people with, with a glimpse behind a curtain of history in the past and in the future. And history, what often seems to us kind of as, ebb, 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 as an ebb and flow without rhyme or reason, history, what kind of moves along and not much can be done about it, especially those currents that flow against God and God's people, the events of history in our lives that weary us, that seek to break us. But history as God uses history is well thought out. God's history is designed. God, his history is decreed, and it's according to his sovereign will. 
And the point isn't whether we've been treated unjustly. Like there's a lot of people who are just up in arms because of the mistreatments that have taken place in this last week. We can relate, but it's not about whether or not we get treated unjustly or whether or not God is doing what we think he ought to be doing. Like we have the right to tell God what to do. But the point is for us to be in alignment with God's will. And that, that's what God goes out of his way to esteem Daniel for. I want you to hear this. In times when we're weary, we need to learn to exalt God. When we're, when we're worried and heavy laden, what's the song tells us? Are you wearied? Over joys departed, tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He's a friend that's well known. He's who we can give it to. He's who we can share it with. We, uh, we need to be in alignment with him and focus on him and learn to exalt him and to not, not on, on what wearies us, but we seek his will be done. I have a friend of mine that she always, she said, I, I won't pray for something specifically, but I'll pray that God's will will be done. And I've often wondered at times, and I thought, I need you to pray something specifically. But you know when she's saying, I'm praying for God's will to be done? It's nothing better. That's where you want your prayers, isn't it? You make sure that your will, God's will is done in your life and in my life. Get in alignment with God's movement in history of what's going on. And then all these other things are just out there and they don't wear it, weigh us down and wear us out. Courage comes even in times of weariness. Courage comes as we see God's movement in history and we learn to see ourselves as a part of that movement. This morning as we come to our hymn of invitation, 591 is Have Thine Own Way. And I know that the first thing to making sure that we're in alignment with God is to be making sure we're in relationship with Jesus. What is our relationship with Jesus? If we've never named Jesus as Lord and Master of our life, then we have no way of being in alignment with God. But for us as a, as a, a group, predominantly as Christian believers, I want to be an encouragement for you to have... To, as believers to live in alignment with the word of God maybe you're frustrated maybe you're one who is, is, is just out of kilter with some of that stuff we can pray for one another to be in alignment and have his will be done in our life so if that's a need in your life this day we invite you to share that with us won't you stand as we sing have thine own way Lord. let his will be done in your life today Appreciate you tolerating uh, the the sinus attack, I guess, that's been on me and my voice and everything else. And but uh, I thank you for that. And, and uh, I know some others are going through the very same thing. So don't forget the uh, announcements that are on the screen that'll be playing, and uh, keep keep uh, charge of those. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father God, I thank you so very much for the opportunity to allow us to uh, spend time in your word, Father, to come and worship and gather around your table of love and memory. Father, I thank you that uh, you made a covenant with us, and Lord, you've given it all, and you, you, you know, you're everything, and so help us to, to say yes to you. And Father, as we say yes to you, I pray that you'll help us apply that as we go throughout our lives, that as we see the things that are going on in our world and things that are causing concern and chaos and, and all sorts of issues, help us to just remember that you're in control and we want to align our lives with your will. Have your will be done in our lives, Father, and help us to encourage and, and challenge other people to a relationship with you. Help us as we leave this place today. Go with us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day. <clears throat>